gonna show you what I know. Break it free from the mainstream, the studio machine. I want it my way. Indie film nation. I want it my way. Indie film nation. Going all the way. Indie film nation. You know it's gotta be. Hi, this is Bruce Himmelblau with Indie Film Nation. We're here at Slam Dance with writer, director Sean Meredith. Uh, Sean, can you tell me a little bit about Dante's Inferno? Um, it's uh, our film is a modern interpretation of the original ancient poem about the trip through hell. So, but ours is a it's he's you know Dante's a contemporary man and he has to travel through like an urban decrepit environment and underworld. Um, and it's that basic story of. Uh, you know, you get lost and you go through the darkness to get back to the light. But our film is done, it's not a regular live action film, but it is, it's, it's toy theater puppetry, so it's all paper cutouts, and it's all based on, you know, wires and rods and strings and stuff. So it's just, it's, it looks like a bit like an animated graphic novel. So it's a shot live action. So a shot live action as opposed to stop animation where you go yeah. frame by frame. Yeah. Frame. There's live puppeteers working the thing, and it gives it that it gives it the, a, a real feel of things happening. It's, you know, the the beauty of the film is in this age of CGI and special effects and stuff like that. The entire film is all just handmade, hand drawn, hand painted, um, hand animated. So, what did you shoot it on? Um, we shot on a Vericam, um, and uh, we used some special HD probe lenses that would let us get the angles on these small puppets. Because uh, if you have a big cine lens, you can't even get at the angles. If you can't do a close up of your of an actor's head, if the actor's head's only that big, with a cine lens, you can't you can't pick how you're sh going to shoot it that much. Even though we had one on set when we did wide shots and stuff like that, so this could you could actually point the camera down towards the, ta the our stage a little bit with a 45 degree angle adapter and just sort of it would sort of just look you could look up at your little actors as if there's a little camera on the stage. So that was, and then we also, the, one of the unique aspects was because we were on one location the whole time, it, it became an opportunity to actually shoot straight to disc. So we captured um, SDI, HD SDI out of, the, out of the camera straight to hard drive. So it's all, it was all an, uh, an uncompressed 10-bit QuickTime files of the film. So it gave us a lot of latitude um, when we were color correcting and stuff to have that much more color information and have full frame instead of compressed on tape. So. And what resolution did you use? Um, Vericam is a uh, 720, so it's 720p, but you know, unlike like, like HD cam and and the HD DVC Pro, um, it's all downsampled. So like, so if you shoot 720p to tape, it's actually like they they squeeze the number of pixels across. And the same thing with HD cam, if it's 1920 across, they actually squeeze it to 1440. But when you're able to go uncompressed to disc, it gives you the full frame and stuff without any downsampling. So it, was, it, was, it wasn't even 1K, but it's, it, was in, it was HD. But the main thing I wanted to get was all the color information. I mean, the, the having the, you know, maybe 1080p uncompressed would have been even better. But uh, the main thing I really wanted to get was a, a, was a lot of color information about, uh, so just because the drawings and paintings were so beautiful. And how long would the process take? When did you start this project and... We, um, after we wrote the first draft of the script, we started building. Like, we'd rewrite the script, and as each scene got rewritten, it would be released for building. And so that process was about six months of building 40-some sets and four to 500 puppets. And the script had to be very exacting. So it's a 77-minute film, but it's a 150-page script because there's so much detail about what needed to be built, what kind of puppet, and what the puppet needed to do. Because we couldn't just wing that stuff on set. You couldn't. It's not like a film where you could rehearse the scene and figure out what they're going to do, you know, on set. You really had to figure out before because all the stuff had to be built before. So it was a, it was a very exacting process. And what this, this little piece of paper that jiggled around. Sorry. And this is uh, basically shot in, in kind of a three D uh, imaging. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, even though it's flat paper cutouts, it's not like South Park where it's you know like practically two D flat on a table. It's it's a three D world, so it's all built up out of flat pieces of paper so but the sets have a lot of depth and it's actually very cinematic in its in its depth and how it's shot and um you know we because it's on a small scale you, we were able to do a lot of uh beautiful you know crane moves and stuff like that that looked like if they were outdoors it, you know you we can crane down 
three stories and stuff like that without having, you know, massive cranes outside because it's just a small set the size of a pool table. Um, so it was actually, you know, really challenging for the camera department in some ways because of that, because the things were the I, things were so small and uh, their moves had to be really exacting, both the operator and the AC for focus pulling. And how large was your crew on set and how large was your crew in post? The crew on set was sometimes we'd have like 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 puppeteers around at all times and they'd both be working, um, you know, as puppeteers but also, you know, gluing, redoing stuff because you need different size rods. So they're constantly working to, to keep the puppets in good shape and stuff like that. And so, And then the camera department, lighting department, I guess we'd usually have about 20 to 25 people on set. It was a 12-day shoot. Um, and, uh, and then in post, um, was it just the editor all by himself and in, in a little corner or in a little, huh? the editor was all by himself in a little, uh, secluded room with no windows and, uh, I had a, I had a window. I was the editor. Um, I, I post was pretty much me. I mean, my two writers and producers, they're my creative partners and, um, I would work for periods of time and they would come in and we would then debate dialogue and a little bit of editing stuff and stuff like that but mostly the debates were about when we were writing rewriting dialogue and casting and stuff like that but post was pretty much me um and like from you know all the sound editing to uh to the cut and um and stuff like that and then sound effects editing and then at the very end I brought in a sound designer to help add a number of more layers just before our mix and stuff like that to help me with stuff that you know I hadn't gotten to and so and what did you edit on uh, Final Cut Pro, and that's what I've been editing on probably for six, seven years now, um, and uh, and which I which I love. It's just it's like I just there's no there's no rhyme or reason except for the fact it works, you know. And uh, but and it works and worked. I always, I was worried about working uncompressed because it's a huge amount of data. It's three terabytes of storage and accessing that on a daily basis constantly. I was worried about if Final Cut Pro would work the same way it does when I've always edited DV over the years, and it works you know for me it always worked just the same so it was it wasn't a difficult you know issue so and how did you cast the film and who, who's in the cast um the main two characters are dante and virgil and they they're the guys who go through hell and dante's voice is dermot moroni and virgil's voice is james cromwell i had originally thought of Derm the the role of dante as a young man who you know was unsure of himself maybe had some some breaking in his voice and stuff like that. And the part of Virgil, the poet, would be like an old scraggly guy, you know, an old po weathered poet, you know. But I had Dermot read for Dante just because I loved his resonant voice, and it made me rethink how I was going to cast Virgil because now I didn't – I realized I'd been really uptight. And so that Cromwell was the first thing I thought of after that because I thought – I didn't need that old weathered guy. I could use somebody who's just quiet and confident and exuded that through the way he spoke without having to add a lot of extra jazz onto it. So, and they they gel very well together. I'm really happy about it. Great. And uh, how can we find out more about Dante's Inferno? Um, the website is DanteFilm.com. Um, there's also a, a spot, you know, page for it on MySpace. But yeah, Dante's Inferno, DanteFilm.com has. Um, everything about the film, it has a trailer that's really informative, and they can keep up to date with the screenings on the website and all of our announcements and stuff. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, man. Great. Okay. Stay tuned for more in the series of podcasts from Sundance and Slamdance here on Indie Film Nation. Indie Film Nation.